The episode begins with Seth recalling a childhood memory when he was with his mother. She told him that he had royal blood running through his veins, and he was supposed to stand by the king. However, she expressed regret that she had given birth to him in his current form, constantly reminding him that he was her favorite. In reality, we see Seth standing before the king, who is on a flying creature. Seth looks at the king with fear and dread. The king descends from his flying mount and asks Seth to stay a little distance away to avoid getting hurt during the battle. The king then approaches Seth and tells him that even if he were to return to his human form, nothing would change. He has already been exposed to the people of the kingdom, and no throne will accept him now. Seth uses his greatest power and directs it toward the king, but the king creates a large barrier around himself, using his royal power, effortlessly blocking all of Seth's attacks. Seth becomes exhausted from his efforts and stops. The king stands directly in front of him and chokes him by the neck. The king informs Seth that his obsession with racial purity has led the kingdom astray and caused great harm to those the king cherishes. He wants Seth to be sure that even if he is forced to relinquish the throne, he won't move from his spot until he pays the price for all his crimes. The king then throws Seth to the ground. At this moment, Lant and his young companions arrive and rejoice at seeing their king return to his natural form. Everyone is astonished to witness the king's incredible strength, despite only having half human blood. It's clear that no ordinary monsters could match him. The king speaks to them, explaining that the strength he needs as a king is not derived solely from his royal lineage, but rather from the power to protect those who fight to live in this kingdom. Since Seth has failed to grasp this concept, he no longer has any right to the throne. Seth gathers his strength and mocks the king, considering the protection of the kingdom's people to be the king's power, even though no one protected his mother when she was isolated due to her appearance. He recalls how he found a sealed manuscript of forbidden spells deep in the restricted library which only those with royal blood could use. He claims that he now possesses the power of the king. At this moment, Sari retrieves the stone left for her by the high priest, Kabiel, who had been absent for a long time. To everyone's surprise, a voice emanates from the stone, revealing itself to be Kabiel, the high priest. He explains that he had taken on the form of a speechless demon to protect the kingdom's true secret. He reveals that the former king was physically incapable of having children. Although he married many women, including the queen, he was unable to father any children from them or his other partners. In the end, the king falsely claimed that his nephew was his son, and this was the true lineage of the monarchy. One of the king's mistresses betrayed him and became pregnant by another man. The king falsely claimed that the child was his, and the priest witnessed this, marking another of his sins. When Seth hears this revelation, he becomes extremely angry because his entire life has been a lie, and he finds it difficult to believe. However, now that he possesses the king's power, he is determined to prove it to them. He begins gathering his strength to use it, and the king tries to stop him. Seth harnesses the immense power within him and attempts to unleash it, causing severe wounds and bloodshed on his own body. He falls to the ground, bewildered by what has happened. The king explains that this is the limit of his abilities, as those forbidden spells consume an enormous amount of magical power. Seth has become obsessed with overwhelming power and has never truly accepted himself. As a result, he has lost everything. Seth recalls his mother once more and realizes that everything he lived through was a lie and all his efforts were always in vain. He is deeply saddened by what has transpired. At this moment, Sari approaches him and tells him that no matter what has happened, he is now better than ever. The meaning that once caused him so much suffering should be abandoned, and he should embrace himself just as he was born. No one can become Seth, no matter what happens. Seth remembers that Sari's words mirror those of his mother exactly and that his mother loves him deeply, no matter what. No ma then we see the king entering his advisor's chamber, and the advisor acknowledges that he knows the king is angry with him. 
The king responds that it should be the other way around because he had deceived him all this time. The advisor retorts that he had always openly expressed his disdain for humans during his presence. And it was only natural that he couldn't bring himself to admit that he was once a human and blame himself for his weakness. He doesn't blame the king and can't forgive himself. As his wounds begin to heal a bit, and he regains the ability to walk on his own, he decides to leave the kingdom immediately. Throughout this time, the advisor has done nothing but trouble the king. And now that he realizes the truth, he can't bear to stay by his side any longer. Instead, he chooses to be with the girl, Sari, who had guided him to become a greater king than anything else. The king acknowledges that the advisor is right, and Sari had made him the strongest among all. However, he also recognizes that it was possible because he was by his side, transforming someone weak like Leo into a king and playing the role of a villain all along. No one knows this better than the advisor Anubis. Without Anubis, Leo would have remained weak forever, and he might have been dethroned before he ever met Sari. The king decides to approach Anubis and express his desire for him to accept Sari, the woman he truly loves, as it is his loyal friend's wish. Tears stream down Anubis' eyes as the king places his hand on Anubis' hand, and he reminisces about their childhood. Anubis tells the king that he should not be treated as a subordinate but as a friend. He never cared about how much he was rejected and hated, and he can never go back to what they once were. The scene then shifts to Lant walking with the commander of the royal guard. He asks the commander if he knew that the advisor was not a traitor all along. The commander replies that it was impossible for someone as contradictory as him to directly commit such betrayal. He advises Lant that they should deal with the selection teams that followed Seth's mentality more cautiously and continue their training together. Finally, the scene shifts to Sari and the king. She opens a secret compartment in the wall and retrieves a diary. She explains that this is the daily diary she brought from Iwana. It was hidden in the corridor where the king used to leave sacrifices. She hands the diary to the king, informing him that it might not contain any new discoveries and that he might wish he had never read it. The king takes the diary from her, ready to delve into its contents. The king continues reading the diary, which contains the story of a child born of a human mother and a monster father, a child who grew up with the inner struggle of being both human and a monster. The diary recounts how this child might be disappointed in their monster father, or even resent the mother for loving a monster. The child was wounded deeply in battle and wished for a peaceful death. The family immediately rejected him at birth, and he had no home or loved ones to return to. He couldn't gain recognition except through fighting, but he grew tired of hurting people and simply wanted to live and be loved in return. The child was vastly different from the king's perception of a monster. Sari extends her hand to the king, assuring him that she will love him. The child goes on to explain that every family rejected him due to his red eyes, which marked him as a sorcerer. He was entirely alone and nameless, with no regard for his past. Despite this, fate had brought them together, even though he had left early. He mentions that he will tell their child about him, how his father eagerly awaited his birth, and how he wished for the child to love someone, and most importantly, to love themselves deeply from the bottom of their heart. Tears flow from Leo's eyes and Sari comforts him, making sure he's okay. Leo reassures her and mentions that these tears are not of sadness. He then continues reading the diary, where the mother expresses her certainty that the child will be born healthy. If it's a boy, she intends to name him Richard, after the legendary king known as the Lionheart. She hopes that their child will have a lion's heart that cannot be conquered, and she wishes for him to be strong and courageous. King Leo remarks that he now truly understands who he is. He thanks Sari for sharing this diary with him, and she responds by saying that she passed on the diary that was given to her. She suggests that his real name might be Richard and asks if she should call him that from now on. The king decides that his only name is the one she gave him, and from now on, he will face everyone with his true self keeping no secrets, including her.
On the other hand, we move to the royal palace, where a large crowd has gathered to hear the king's speech. Princess Amit is suddenly surprised because the king is resuming the event from where it left off last time. Lanat reassures her that everything will be fine. Then, one of Sari's young friends asks Princess Amet why she didn't ask the sacred beast of Sari to heal her. She feels embarrassed by the question, but then remembers the captain of the royal guard. The captain asks her to tell him what happened and apologizes to her, emphasizing that he, as a knight, didn't get hurt while she suffered a wound like that. Princess Amit explains that she did it to herself and is pleased that she could be of some help. However, she humbly acknowledges that her contributions were insignificant compared to theirs. The captain holds her hand and thanks her for her assistance, stating that he doesn't know of any hands more beautiful than hers, making her blush with shyness. Suddenly, the captain of the royal guard tells everyone to be silent as King Leonhardt is about to speak. King Leonhardt appears and begins his speech. He mentions that a few days ago, in this very place, he revealed his hidden half-human heritage. He acknowledges that proving his royal lineage won't change this fact. He goes on to say that his efforts to mend relationships were not driven by the desire to hide his lineage, but because he learned to love someone who was once a miserable girl sacrificed to Ozimargo. He continues by saying that no one has a heart stronger than hers, and she supported his weak heart. He adds that her personality had an impact on him and others, making him realize that the kingdom he truly needs to build is one that is not restricted by race or birth. In this kingdom, people are free to love as they are. Queen Sari enters, and King Leonhardt holds her. He reiterates his determination to defend Ozimargo with her by his side, vowing to do so until his last breath. He asks everyone to pledge their loyalty to him as King Leonhardt of Ozimargo, and the crowd responds with overwhelming positivity, shouting, Long live King Leonhardt, long live Queen Sari. Everyone is filled with happiness. On the other hand, we move inside the palace where King Leonhardt's advisor, Anubis, informs the king that their second meeting with Yuana is scheduled for tomorrow. He apologizes for the haste, but asks the king to prepare immediately after the event. King Leonhardt reassures him that it's the most important time, even for newlyweds, as they need to attend to important matters. The captain of his guard assures the king that they will dedicate their hearts and souls to his majesty more than ever. Queen Sari enters the scene wearing a beautiful dress. King Leonhardt compliments her, saying she looks incredibly beautiful, as she is his queen and more beautiful than anything in the world. She tells him that before becoming his true queen, she grew up in the small northern village of Noel. She had a mother, a father, and an older sister, and she never questioned her happiness until she learned about sacrifices. She accepted her fate, finding it much easier than thinking about it or resisting it. But everything changed when she met him because he chose her. She was able to confront her destiny, and now, from the depths of her heart, she feels truly happy. She hopes that he will stay with her forever through good times and bad. King Leonhart reciprocates her feelings, saying that he shares the same sentiment. Queen Sari mentions that for the next day and the day after that, and even after a decade or a century, she will always feel this way. She considers herself lucky because she could live with everyone and by his side. She sees this as just the beginning for their kingdom and for everyone. Meanwhile, a few years later, Prince Nolan, nicknamed Richard, is born. The scene shifts to the small balls where Sari's friends are very upset with Prince Richard for skipping his lessons again. They are worried that Lord Anubis will be angry with them. However, Prince Richard is faster than them and teases them, saying that he doesn't like Lord Anubis because he's always angry. Suddenly, he falls into a pit, and they can't get him out. He then transforms into his human form and exits the pit. Sari and her friends are surprised by...